I guess we can play the video game now or whatever. I don't trust it either. <laughs> Just gonna preemptively turn the music back down because I guarantee you, whatever the song plays when we meet these characters is gonna be a lot louder. But yeah, look, we got eh. it's John and Rose. I'm excited. Okay, all right, okay. All right, volume one magic is fucking real. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm. If you mean out of these two, probably Rose. But I'm still like super excited for John too. If you mean out of all the Homestuck, oh, there's a lot of people I'm excited to meet for different reasons. I didn't even- I was just laughing at this face, but I- <laughs> You click to the last page of the Homestuck epilogues, you read it, then you read it again. You scroll down to get to the next section and find nothing? What the fuck? Are you serious? What kind of ending was that? Absolutely nothing got resolved. You stand up so fast, your chair falls over. Jesus Christ, are you steamed. Maybe eventually, with further thought, you'll come to appreciate the, th the thematic elements. But as of right now, you need to understand. What happened to Ted John? What about Rose and Kanaya and their marriage? What about Terezi and Briska? <gasps> or... <laughs> I'm a move MSPA reader. <laughs> Don't worry about anything they're saying. You're telling me Doc Scratch forced MSPA reader to read not only Homestuck, but the epilogues too? <laughs> oh, MSPA reader. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go punch Doc Scratch in the face. This is, an, this is an outrage. God, you have to have words with someone. Stomping out of the little computer room, you blink a few times, trying to readjust to the dim parlor after staring at a screen for so long. Doc Scratch? Where is that creepy round motherfucker? <laughs> you sure got his number now. You're going to find him and force him to tell you the rest of the story. You march confidently down the hall in the direction of a, in the direction of a sudden ruckus. Pointing the corner, you see two figures. One is definitely Doc Scratch, the other is a dark silhouette in a fashionable hat and coat. While at, while you watch, the latter begins to hit the former with the cane. We read about this. <laughs> Oh god damn it. You know what's happening. You know some lore. <laughs> you need to get out of here before this place goes up in flames. Survive now. Yell about unsatisfactory narratives later. <laughs> With that in mind, you leave behind this ridiculous altercation. Trampling a pile of notes and photographs underfoot as you make a run for the fenestrated wall. See ya suckers. You sail, through the, you sail through feet first, bracing for the smell of overturned earth and the sight of the twin alternian moons. Man, it's going to be good to see your friends again, especially now that you're armed with all this canon knowledge. But what surrounds you is not Father's corpse field, it's a whole lot of nothing. Are you lost between worlds or something? That would put us in the dream bubbles, right? <laughs> Next thing that happens is Mina tries to kill us. Wait, no. You see a glimmer in the distance, a bright white light, swallow swallowing down the surge of panic, you move towards it. The light coalesces in the form of a small symbolic house. Hey, you recognize this house. You wonder if you can just sort of... Isn't this the exact dialogue from before, right before John put his arm... Oh, okay. 
Well, <laughs> you did that. A barrage of images hits you. Broken, chaotic flashes too fractured to make sense of. You just suck your you just stuck your hand into the most powerful item in the whole of this narrative and your body is not taking it well. Bright sizzling pain hits the nerve center of your brain and radiates, radiates out of your extremities. Wow, you are a moron. You aren't a comic character. You aren't meant for this sort of metatextual energy. MSPA reader. <laughs> what you mean you aren't a comic character? If you read the story, then you saw yourself reading the story in the story. It hurts, it burns, it unravels you from the inside out, and then everything goes white. What a lovely morning. The air is fresh and crisp. It's early spring, probably. You find, you, you find yourself on the sidewalk in a suburban neighborhood, facing a neat, friendly house. A neat, friendly boy stands at the window on the second floor, looking down at you. At least you hope he's friendly. Man, you would really love to be his friend. Ah, shit. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> I did. The music thinks it can just do this to me. At first you think the boy is looking at you, but instead he appears to be looking at the mailbox, which is stuffed so full the door is half open. Looks like someone crammed a whole box in there. Oh, where? Hopefully, you pull it out, along with a couple of coupons and envelopes stamped with a green symbol. Helpfully. That says helpfully. I can read. You go to give the boy a thumbs up, but he's no longer- He is no longer- not longer at the window. Is it about to start raining personal- no, personal artifacts out of the window? That would be it towards the backyard, though. Let's go to the backyard so we can get a cake thrown at us. Memory prickles at the corners of your awareness. You feel like you've- maybe done this before while you're standing there ruminating a car pulls up the driver is wearing a hat and a suit and is probably the owner of this house and the father of that friendly boy oh shit you were just standing out <laughs> you're just standing out here with all his mail he's going to think you're trying to rob the place well let's see if we play it cool dad egbert's cool right <laughs> dad egbert's cool that Egbert's also really strong, isn't he? This'll be fine. Let's play it cool. Sup? I was just gonna take this to your child who I've never met before. Not wanting to behave like a complete buffoon and draw attention to yourself, you just hide all the mail stuff behind your back. There's a bunch of envelopes though, and the box is bulky, so all of it sort of slithers from your grasp like a bunch of dead snakes. The distinguished man in his flawless suit looks at you from across the yard. You can't see his eyes under the brim of his hat, but you're absolutely sure he is giving you a look of intense fatherly disappointment, Dad Egbert. No. No. A bolt of shame goes through you. Man, this guy is good. He's not even your dad and you're just losing it under his disapproval. You expect him to start shouting or calling the cops. You are so obviously stealing his mail, but instead he just keeps looking at you. Does he know you? Is he someone you should remember? Or is it just the platonic ideal of dadliness that crosses time and space, eternal in all iterations of reality? That sounds like some bullshit though. Slowly, the distinguished man shakes his head. He goes inside. You can't quite put your finger on why, but you know you have been summarily, um, summarily dismissed. Oh. But did I steal the mail? 
Sorry, John. No expert for you. <laughs> Sorry, John, what's Esper? <laughs> Quick as you can, you turn around and dump everything in the sewer. Whatever. It was probably all, all garbage anyway. Who even uses their mailbox these days? F. <laughs> G. G. <laughs> Like, does this mean that the meteors won't happen because they won't get to fully establish a session? Or <laughs> does this mean there's just no way to escape the meteor that's gonna land directly on this house that we're at? The friendly and fatherly figure parks his car, climbs out, and tips his hat to you. Then he walks to the house, not sensing a single thing amiss. The perfect crime. Uh-huh. Oh, but here comes the boy out the front door. God, you hope he wasn't coming down for the mail. A residential boy approaches. Wait a minute. This is not the s MSPA reader. This is not the same boy you saw peeking through the window. It possibly is not a boy at all. It appears to be a mysterious gentleman. You wonder what business this fine upstanding neighborhood gentleman would have for you. Hey! Hi, John! Hi, John Egbert! What's up? I saw you standing out here messing with the mailbox. I figured you might be the mailman. John Egbert is very wise. And it's John Egbert. <laughs> Even though you're not wearing a mailman outfit. Oh. Oh yeah, that's you. You're definitely the mailman. Your outfit is, um, it's in the laundry today. You're just wearing your mailman hoodie. See the symbol? It's the symbol of a uh, mail. Nothing stops the mail. Where's my wife, PM? <laughs> that's great. I guess it's true after all that mailmen are completely relentless in their quest to deliver people's mail. You guys are incredible. Speaking of mail, do you know if I got any today? <laughs> I'm sure there was nothing important in the mail today. What? No, what red package? You haven't seen anything like that. No bills, junk mail, nothing at all. The mailbox was empty when you looked inside. Aren't I the mailman when am I? <laughs> um, well, I didn't say anything about a red package. Should I be expecting one? Come to think of it, it is my birthday, so getting a package in the mail would make sense. And if it's red, that probably means it's from Dave. He loves red, because I guess it's cool. Oh man, I wonder what he got me. Nothing. He got you nothing, you say. Isn't he listening? This Dave fellow probably forgot his birthday due to being a bad friend. <laughs> and that's why there's no package, red or otherwise. <laughs> What? Oh, uh, just kidding, you say. You're sure Dave is a great friend who cares about this kid a lot. His present is probably just late, and definitely not slowly sinking in a subterranean river of shit right now. It's not... What? That's a strange thing to say. Are you sure you don't know more about Dave's present than you're telling me? No, you say. Absolutely not. Actually, he should forget what you said about the present being late. He should not be expecting a red package, not now or ever. He should trust you, because all men, mailmen know everything about mail. <laughs> Dang, so nothing else? Huh? You said the box was empty? I don't think I understand. Isn't that how it always is when you deliver mail? I mean, you're the guy who's supposed to put stuff in there. Yes, that's right. You're the mailman. The absolute authority over all mail, which means your word must be accepted without question when it comes to mail. He didn't get to get there. 
You double checked and everything. You looked thoroughly through your mail bag for anything with this kid's name on it and came up empty. Sorry, dude. You have a mail bag? Where is it? <laughs> uh, oh, that th old thing? You accidentally dropped it in the sewer before the boy came outside. <laughs> oh no, that sucks. All that mail ruined. Maybe I can help you fish it out. No, you mean that's fine. Thanks for offering, fine young Samaritan. But, um, the government will handle this. There's, like, insurance and such for sewer-related postal mishaps. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, but... What if you miss something in there for me, like a game envelope or such? Are you totally sure you didn't miss something? Yes! You are sure. You triple-checked and didn't see his name on anything. Besides, it's a really rank- it's really rank down there. Very sewery. All the mail has been befouled beyond any hope of salvaging it, really. It's best not to bother even peeking inside. <sighs> Sigh. <laughs> You're probably right, but... Hey, how do you know my name? What? Oh, god damn it. Huh? Oh, you mean, of course you know his name. Mailmen are sort of like Santa Claus. They know the names of all the good little boys in their delivery routes. Wait, okay, that sounded creepy. You really regret phrasing it like that. It was so completely unnecessary. You just know a lot of stuff as an important government official with lots of bureaucratic lists and such. For instance, the name of this young man is... Damn. Why do you always paint yourself into corners like this? All you're trying to do is make new friends, and you somehow manage to bullshit your way through the absolute most challenging version of this conversation possible. Okay, you can do this. This th this young man name it. This young man is what I just said. This young man's name is. Wow, it really could be anything. He might as well have been given a random ass name this very day, shortly before you arrive. For all you know. You'll just have to go with your gut and feel it out. A new friendship is on the line. His name is... St st wait, no, he's making a bad face. You're on the wrong track. <laughs> j j oh, he's freaking up. This is good. J yeah, nope, bad face again. It's not Jimmy or um, j Jillium. That's not even a name anyway. J oh, yes, yes, he likes that. Jahan... <laughs> <laughs> Jomb... Jombrami? Jombrami? Shit, he looks disgusted. Abort! Jombrami? You really can't be- You really can't be quite the idiot sometimes. John derson Jonderson? Wait, he looked pleased for a minute, then it looked like he just sucked on a lemon. Jesus Christ, you're bad at this. You were close there. Jonder... Jonderbilt? Yikes, no. Ah, oh, you got it. It's just John, of course. You don't know what you were even thinking. Yes, you do. Those were just goofs. You explained to John. Mailmen love goofs. <laughs> you know, just mailman goofing. His name is John, you say confidently, as if you had it, <laughs> had it in the bag all along. Not your non-existent mail bag, which you told him you dropped in the sewer. Your real bag, where the good shit is, such as your incredible ability to guess someone's name in five or six tries. <laughs> That's right! <laughs> wow, I guess it's true then. Mailmen really do know practically everything. You smile. Finally, it feels like this friendship may be starting to click. It was rocky there for a while, as you had to spin an intricate, nearly flawless web of lies to smooth over the fact that you destroyed his cherished personal property. But you're pretty sure you're in the clear now, and you'll never have to justify yourself to him again. Well, as nice as it is to meet you, Mr. Mailman, to be honest, this just kind of sucks. I've been waiting for a really cool game to arrive in the mail, but it's been a few days already, and now I'm starting to think it got lost in the mail? It might just never come now, and I'm kind of bummed out about it. I had some hope it would show up on my birthday as, like, a present? From nobody, really. Just a present out of thin air, I guess, like it was going to be Destiny or something? Oh well, I guess magic really is fake and all the, as all the scientists say it is. 
You nod along very wisely. Oh yes, you say. You can kiss that game goodbye. It definitely got lost in the mail and is never ever going to be delivered. The Postmaster General just told you a few seconds ago, um, through your wireless earpiece which is hooked up to the US parcel mainframe. <laughs> You told John he is right to disbelieve in magic. It's fake as shit. It's time for him to get used to the idea that he will never play this game, whatever it was. It was probably stupid anyway. Most games are. He should try to get used to whatever kind of life he is going to live from now until now on in this absence of this dumb video game. Yeah, you're right. I think I got too worked up about it. It probably does suck, actually. I mean, <laughs> it kind of does. <laughs> I think GameBro only gave it like two hats out of five hats. It might have been even less than that, actually. God, what a piece of shit it probably was. John, Jonathan Egbert. You know, I really have to thank you, Mr. Mailman. You really opened my eyes today. I'm going to forget I ever heard of that dumb game and just try to enjoy my life. Talk to my friends, hang out in my room, and I'll. Come to think of it, maybe I was looking forward to playing that game with my friends so much because I'm lonely? I'm almost a little embarrassed to admit I don't actually have any real life friends. Why doesn't John have any friends? Oh, this is it. This is your in. This nice boy seems to be jonesing for a friendship just as much as you are. And you've laid out all the groundwork for becoming his best bro so expertly. Have I? You just need to st stride right into his life. Slide right into his life with just a few more sympathetic remarks. You actually have a lot of experience with this by now. You've made so many friends in so many strange places with such mixed results, or you think you did? Actually, you can't conjure up any of their names or faces right now. It probably isn't important. Actually, let's never speak of that again. What matters most is you're here now making a sweet new pal named John. You casually mention that this is the end of your mail route and you don't have much else going on in your life. Maybe you and he can hang out for a while? If he doesn't mind, that is. Hmm, you wanna hang out with me? Like, just as a mailman and a 13 year old boy just being buddies? You shrug a little as if you don't care much, but you really, really care. Normally I would say that sounds a little strange and maybe slightly inappropriate, but what do I know? If you were a normal looking mailman, that would probably be a shitty idea and I'd get in trouble with my dad or the authorities or something and probably so would you, but you seem different. Like maybe you aren't even a person? What? Hey John, what does that mean? Just kind of, just a kind of weird, harmless looking guy? Like an alien, but not really? You don't really know what to say to any of this. Oh man, I'm being so fucking rude. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course we can hang out. But maybe we should, uh, keep this sort of a secret from my dad? I don't know if he would approve of me bringing a stranger into the house, even if you are very nice and sincerely concerned about my male problems. That sounds fine with you. Now that you think about it, you still aren't sure his dad didn't see him dumping all their mail into the sewer. He probably didn't, otherwise he would have some words with you, surely. But still, it's a risk you shouldn't be taking under these delicate circumstances. There's a friendship on the line. Okay, I'm glad you agree. It sounds like we have a sneaking mission ahead of us. Actually, it sounds like it could be fun. Oh yeah, it does sound fun. Except maybe slightly triggering since you've done a lot of dangerous high stakes sneaking in the past that you can't quite remember. But still, fun. Mostly fun. You, you can't wait. Yeah. So, how should we do this? We could either sneak upstairs to my bedroom while avoiding my dad and just hang out up there for a while. Or if that sounds too risky, we could just stay outside. I've got some sweet playground equipment in the backyard. What will it be? Playground equipment, you say? Actually, you tell John you think the fresh air out here will do you some good. Also, that playground equipment he mentioned really sweetens the pot. You hope he doesn't mind. After all, as a mailman, you weren't meant to be in out you were meant to be outdoors. You took a mailman's oath and everything. Um, yeah, John will probably believe that. Sure, no problem. I totally understand. It gets really stuffy in there, especially with all the baking my dad does. 
We can hang out in my yard. Feels like it's been ages since I took a spin on the old pogo ride. Pogo ride, he says. Well, that just seals the deal. You bought flamboyantly and gestured for him to lead the way, but you quickly regret doing that because it was a little much. Well, here it is, my backyard in all its glory. I hardly come out here anymore, honestly. There's the old trusty swing set, ah, brings back some good memories. And there's the pogo ride. You better hop on before I beat you to it. <laughs> Just kidding, that thing is a death trap. You should really go nowhere near that thing unless you like dying. Oblivious to the humorous nature of his remark, you shake your head solemnly. Oh no, you say. You're pretty sure dying sucks and you never want to do it again. Huh? <laughs> That's a weird thing to say. Are you saying you've died before? Or is this some kind of weird male joke? Oh, <laughs> yeah. You mailmen like to joke around a lot, sometimes very darkly. It gets very stressful delivering mail sometimes, and sometimes you just need to blow off some stream by making light of your mortality and... It doesn't seem like this is going over well. To be fair, it is one of your worst explanations so far, and that's really saying something. You start to falter and lose composure. You don't seem to have it in, your, in you to follow through with the lie. You stop talking and hang your head. Hey, what's wrong? You decide to tell him the truth. Yes, you've been dead before. Possibly a bunch of times? You're not sure. Actually, you can't remember any of the circumstances surrounding your deaths and you aren't even sure who you are. Frankly, you're a little confused by your own existence sometimes. Oh no. Well, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a little hard to believe. But I'll listen to what you have to say because that's what friends are for. How did that happen? Oh well, you cast your mind back as hard as you can. You really give it a good hard think. You remember a room and a computer screen and just this really intense feeling of frustration. A computer screen? I don't... I mean, I get being very frustrated at your computer screen. I do that every day. Yeah, he gets it. It's written all over his face. This is a boy who feels your pain. He's following you perfectly. I'm not really following. Then you've explained how you ended up in the afterlife. Afterlife? You're pretty sure it was the afterlife. Maybe heaven? It was a little too freaky for heaven, but you were alone. Then you found a mysterious artifact on the ground. You found a mysterious artifact in hell? <laughs> yes. It was white and flat and lying on the ground as if it was just waiting for you. Or waiting for someone else maybe, but you found it first by accident? You find it hard to believe you were destined for any cursed treasure such as this. Perhaps the artifact belonged to Lucifer himself. Lucifer? Wow. Oh, you didn't realize he said the Lucifer thing out loud. Maybe you should consider reeling this in a bit? You're beginning to wonder if you're coming off as a little <laughs> unhinged here. Except John is clearly transfixed by your story, and looking a little concerned, you guess there's no going back now. You've committed yourself to the truth as insane as it sounds. So you saw something weird. It looked a little like a house? The obvious thing to do was stick your hand inside the house, so that's what you did. Then you felt funny and teleported out of hell. That's how you ended up here on Earth. Where, uh... You then became a mailman and decided to have a long and rewarding career of delivering the mail. And then you met John and now you're basically best friends. The end. That all sounds pretty fucked up. <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? You're right back to feeling like a crazy person again. He probably doesn't believe you. It seems like you're going to have to take this even further or risk eroding the foundation of trust this blossoming friendship is built on. Uh-huh. Foundation of trust. You mentioned that you're pretty sure the devil's treasure gave you some magic powers. Magic powers? Like what? You're not sure. You can sort of teleport now. Also, you're pretty sure you can time travel. You haven't tested it out much, you admit. Teleportation and time travel, huh? That's a lot. You can prove it, you say desperately. Suddenly, it feels like this friendship is hanging by a thread and you'll do anything to preserve it. It's time to bring out the big guns. The revelation to this boy that contrary to all known scientific wisdom, magic is far from fake. It's, it is real as shit. For instance, you remind him that you both almost went up to his bedroom but decided not to because the trek across the house was too risky. But what if you could just teleport there? Sounds like a handy trick. 
I'm still guessing this is all bullshit, bullshit though, like a prank. That's okay though, I love pranks. Ah, uh, but, it but it's no prank, at least you think. You've never actually tested this power at all. God, you hope you don't end up making a fool of yourself. Everything is riding on this. Hey, what are you? Here goes nothing. Whoa, it worked. Unbelievable. Do you know what that this means, Mr. Mailman? You shake your head. It means magic is fucking real. You shrug, you guess it is, you won't admit it, but all you care about right now is the fact that you saved the friendship. It should be all smooth sailing from here. Well, it's pretty. It's a pretty good thing I met you, because if you didn't show up, I'm pretty sure that nothing anywhere close to being this incredible would ever have happened to me. You consider that remark for a moment and decide you absolutely agree. You are definitely the best and most exciting thing that will ever happen to this kid. You also said something about time travel? Can we try that too? Or would that be too disruptive to the space-time continuum? You have him eating out of the palm of your hand now. No need to slow this train down. Continuum shum continuum shumidium. Whatever your new friend wants, he gets. Oh, I know. Why don't we go back in time about a week? We can stay right here, that way we won't risk messing up anything important. Sure, that makes sense. You get ready to use your new hell power and concentrate as hard as you can on the idea of one week ago. That's probably how it works. Hmm, not much changed, except wait, the cakes are gone. That must mean it isn't my birthday yet, which means it worked. This is one week ago, wow. Uh... Oh, for fuck's sake. I forgot. Of course there was going to be a past me in the room a, a week ago. God, I'm such an idiot. This is going to fuck things up, isn't it? What the hell is going on here? Whatever it is, it seems really stupid. You're right, John. It is really- it is stupid. Sorry, I wasn't using my head. Don't worry, we'll get out of your hair. Hey, quick, let's zap out to the yard so we fuck up space- <laughs> So we fuck up space time as little as possible. Mm. Phew. Well, that was dumb. Maybe let's try to avoid abusing your time travel powers from now on. It could really lead to a lot of messy bullshit. You wholeheartedly agree. All you really want to do is make friends, not clown around through space time. Meanwhile, I guess we'll st we're still a week in the past, but now, just standing by my yard doing nothing? This seems pointless. We should probably head back to the present. You nod. It was an interesting experiment and it brought you a lot of credibility, but this time, but it's time to, wait a minute, something is wrong. There's a slight buzzing in the air. You can feel it. What's the matter? You tell him, you tell him you think, you think someone is coming. Quick, you have to hide. Oh, uh, okay. You and John dashed into a neighbor's yard and hide behind the fence. You peek into the backyard to see what's happening. Suddenly you see it. Oh. Oh. Now, Cherise, this is reference. This is from the epilogue. Is what's happening. Yeah, it was a week, wasn't it? He said that. Suddenly you see it. That energy you were, you were feeling was a whole group of teenagers randomly teleporting into John's backyard. Oh, you know what? I was wondering. I was just wondering, but like, this is still the alpha timeline because that's how zapping powers work. I then. <laughs> what the fuck? You examine them more closely. They're all dressed in ridiculous, colorful outfits. Is the circus in town? 
There did seem to be a lot of clowns in John's house. Maybe this house is some kind of globally recognized headquarters for traveling clowns? But they're not really clowns, just teens wearing strange pajama-looking clothes, eight of them to be precise. On closer inspection, one of them seems familiar, the guy in the blue pajamas. You'd think it's your new friend John? But he seems older. Definitely not a 13-year-old kid like your buddy here. None of them are. They all appear to settle in for a while to talk amongst themselves. The guy in the yellow speedo gets down to business on the pogo ride, totally oblivious to its dangers. There seems to be a serious atmosphere hanging over these group of, this group of teens. Important discussions are happening. It's completely baffling to you, and by the look on your buddy's face, to John as well. Suddenly, an uneasy feeling settles over you, like you're witnessing something that was never meant to be seen by anyone, perhaps a rendezvous point established by this group of teens for exactly that reason that no one would think to be watching this quiet suburban backyard right now. Should you stay and listen, or go? You're not sure what to do. You can't shake the feeling that something highly inappropriate is happening here, just by watching, like you're beholding a moment so divorced from authoritative chain of an, an authoritative chain of events that to even witness this moment is not only narratively compromising, but extremely cursed. Hey, is that guy in the blue pajamas... me? You pat John on the back. You can only imagine what's going through his head right now. He hasn't seen a time travel duplicate of himself in, well, minutes. Man, I look so much older. What am I even wearing? And how are all these people- Wait, I know some of them. That's Rose and Dave and Jade with dog ears. <laughs> I don't know the others though. Wait, I know what's going on. They must be from the future. It is the only explanation, especially since we, dis <laughs> we just did time travel ourselves, thus proving magic to be real. Did you have something to do something to do with this, Mr. Mailman? You shake your head. You are just as surprised by this nonsense as he is. It seems that one or more people from the group have somehow obtained similar abilities offered by the hell treasure you touched. I guess they're all from new a few years in the future, where we're all a bunch a bunch of older, cooler teenagers. Maybe we all go to college together or something? There's fanfics about that. Maybe that's where we make these four new friends? There's something familiar about all of them, but I can't put my finger on it. But why do we look so ridiculous? <laughs> Did I join a troupe of traveling street performers, thus following in the footsteps of my father? And somehow manage to rope everyone into the act, including Dave and Rose, who almost certainly would think the idea was really stupid, even though it's clearly great and cool, while somehow also involving time travel? I don't know. I'm so confused. What are they even doing here? Did this really happen just outside my house one week ago without me knowing about it at all? What else have I been missing? How much more is there to know about the future adventures of me and my friends, which has been taking place in secret like this? Well, I can tell you one thing. <laughs> I don't think you're gonna <laughs> go on to that future, buddy. <laughs> I wonder if there's a lot more to my life than I ever could have imagined. Actually, I should probably be thanking you? If you hadn't told me my game got lost in the mail, I might have gotten way too hung up on it. That might have totally altered the trajectory of my life. Then I wouldn't get to go on whatever sweet adventures happen in the future that will lead me to wear a bunch of silly pajamas and apparently speak with great authority in front of groups of very cool teens. You bow your head contemplatively, as if to say, you're welcome. You're welcome for your entire life and every cool thing that ever happens to you from now on. After some time passes, the group of teens seems to finish up whatever business they had in this yard and disappear into thin air. You guess that was the end of whatever that was. Since there isn't much point to staying here a week in the past, you decide to return John to the present moment. Huh, well, that was interesting. We were a little too far away to hear what they were saying. I think I kept overhearing the word English? I wonder if some of those teens speak a foreign language. Was was I teaching them English? Uh-huh. You teleported them to your backyard a week before your birthday in 2009 to teach them English. Phew. This sure is some shitty speculation. It makes no sense at all. 
I guess the only thing to do is wait until I become that John. <laughs> and then find out for myself. Sounds exciting, but also a little overwhelming. Damn, I'm going to need to think about this. You watch as John spaces out for a solid minute, thinking about his absurd future. You glance toward that swing set, wondering if the fun times John had planned for you are going to continue to recede further into the distance as he comes to grips with his mysterious destiny. You cough a little to snap him out of his stupor. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mailman. I know I said we would do something fun, but now I think I'm kind of an ex in an existential mood. I should take a walk and think about what just happened today. I feel weird. It's nothing personal. I just need some space. Well, see you. But like, if he doesn't play, if he doesn't play Esper, the meteor shouldn't come to his house, right? But also, he's not playing it because of zappy reasons. So even if he doesn't play it, the meteor might still come to his house. I'm worried. I don't. I guess we're gonna go inside. Wait, I'm not your friend, right? Yeah. No, that was the wrong button. All right, let's go inside. When you enter the house, an overwhelming order of fr freshly baked cakes hits you like a punch in the face. Wow, there's also a lot of clown bullshit in this living room. Clown statues and you don't have time to take it all in because your buddy John is grabbing you by the hand and rushing you upstairs before his baking maniac of a father can emerge from the kitchen and catch you in the act. He slams the bedroom door behind you and breathes a sigh of relief. Phew. Hard to catch a moment of peace around here, what with all the adoring father fatherly doting and round-the-clock cake production. I feel like I'm suffocating around here, and it's not just because the thick aroma of Betty Crocker products makes me feel like I'm ga being gassed in a bakery. You're not sure what to say. You tentatively lift your arm as if you're about to place it on his shoulder, but you hesitate. Is this an abusive domestic situation? <laughs> uh -huh. You don't know if you have enough information to take that judgment yet, but you are concerned. Haha, <laughs> just joking around. I mean, this baking shit is all a bit much. The clown obsession too, but... I love my dad. He's great. Sorry, I didn't mean to give the wrong impression. That's a relief, you guess. Not that you weren't ready to jump in and be whatever kind of supportive friend this boy needs. Suddenly, you notice a bunch of movie posters on the wall. Oh wow, these are all really bad. <laughs> hey, question. Shouldn't I be seeing... All the stuff he wrote on all his posters should just be here. Unless he never wrote it, because he never plays the game. Is it that deep? <laughs> you won't dare say such a thing to your new friend, though. You immediately begin lavishing praise on all of them, especially that last one, which appears to be Mac and me? Oh, for fuck's sake. When it rains, it pours, you guess. Nevertheless, you insist it's one of humanity's peak cinematic achievements. Mac and me? You seriously like it? Personally, I think it's a piece of shit. I just have it up there because, well, I don't even know why I, it's not, not even I can defend the film. Look. We are gonna read this Homestuck video game and do both. <laughs> To each his own, I guess. <laughs> I'm happy to hear you like all the other movies, though. They're all incredible. You have good taste. Except for liking Mac and Me, though. It's complete garbage. Okay, you can admit you got a little overzealous there. Maybe dial it down a notch? You really don't have to try so hard. 
There's a moment of awkward silence. You hadn't really thought this far ahead, and apparently neither has John. There must be something you can both do to advance this friendship. He's starting to look self-conscious now. Poor friendless kid doesn't know how to, to entertain anyone in his home, does he? You can see now that your friendship is needed now more than ever. You have to step up. So, um, what do you typically like to, uh... Suddenly, something gets John's attention. It's coming from his computer. Oh, hey, can you hang on a second? <laughs> My buddy Dave is pestering me. John settles behind his desk. Dude, what are you doing? Dave, you'll never guess what I'm doing right now. Uh, are you opening the birthday present I got you? <laughs> the what? Oh no, sorry Dave, but I think your present got lost in the mail. Unfortunately, I think it might be gone forever. John, what the fuck? Maybe you can just send me another one, whatever it was? Dude, no. The thing I got you was fucking priceless and irreplaceable. If it's lost in the mail, there's literally zero chance you will ever see another one like it ever again in any shape or form. Wow. That sucks. Oh well, whatever. To be aged, that's probably the fate it deserves. What was it? Never mind, just some more ironic trash from your best and coolest bro in the world. Just forget it. This situation is fine. <laughs> if I tell you... <laughs> If I tell you, you'd probably be sad as gone, so this is a secret I will take with me to my fucking grave. Don't you understand, Egbert? Yeah, that's fair. So what are you really up to? Are you playing that dumb game with Rose yet? There's a lot. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is already so much. And you know what, I just thought about this. When I was playing um, friend sim, I was just like, once I got the true end of a route, once I became, once I befriended somebody, I would move on. But since, you know, this is gonna be coming out two people at a time, I'm just gonna do all the routes. Cause I was only doing that, cause I was trying to get through that game really fast so that I could get to this one. <laughs> but we can take our time with this one. So when I do Rose, if I get her like friendship route the first try, I'll go back and get the non-friendship route. What? Oh, no. That got lost in the mail too. It's also gone forever. Holy fucking shit, John. I leave you alone for two seconds and everything goes to hell. This is- oh fuck. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is why I can't stop pestering you for even a second. You just lose complete control of your life the moment I turn my back. How do you even know it got lost in the mail? Like, how can that even be formally verified in any way you haven't even been waiting for it that long? Because the mailman told me so. What? <laughs> okay, I know I say this almost every day, but that actually is the dumbest thing I ever fucking heard. <laughs> It's true. He was quite sure about it. First of all, John, mailmen don't know shit. <laughs> They're just guys who walk around handing out letters and stuff. They have zero knowledge of the greater workings of the mail, let alone the specific fate of any given package. Unless there's a tracking number or some shit, but even then, mailman, the mailman isn't really the guy who deals with that. The only way a mailman would know for sure if some mail got lost is if he was the one who lost it or like deliberately fucking destroyed it. Between the game and my sweet present going missing, something smells goddamn fishing, fishy here. John, are you sure the mailman didn't just steal all your shit? <laughs> of course I am. I don't know, man. He wasn't even holding anything when I talked to him. Not even a mail. <laughs> John is so stupid. <laughs> oh, I miss John Eckbert. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> he wasn't even holding anything when I talked to him. Not even a mailbag. My alarm bells are going fucking haywire here. It just sounds like this incompetent dipshit just lost all your mail and tried to cover his ass. No! Are you sure he didn't fuck it up somehow? Like, get mailman stank on it in a fit of shame and panic, like, buried it or dunked it in a smelly hole? Dave, this is insane. You're being so paranoid. Besides, aside from the birthday present, why do you even care? You think the game is stupid and you don't even want to play. Yeah, well, I was lying my ass off to sound cool and aloof. <laughs> of course I want to play the game. It's like this whole rad thing we were all going to do as friends and now it's ruined. Uh, you're right. That is a shame. I'm sorry. John Egbert really said all that out loud and is still like, no, of course the mailman did. <laughs> the mailman who didn't have isn't wearing a He should have mentioned the fact that wasn't even wearing a uniform. <laughs> John. <laughs> I don't know, there was just some feeling I had that we needed to play this thing for like destiny reasons or some shit. So Jade, right? Like, <laughs> Jade clearly knows they were supposed to play this game. Which hasn't even been mentioned. I was expecting him to say that too. Like, I know he's not lying to me because he's right here. <laughs> But like, what he's saying about destiny reasons, Jade, her whole thing is... <clears throat> Sorry to blow my cool cover and start sounding like Jade or whatever, but I'm kind of pissed off, especially now that I know you won't get your sick bunny. Bunny? Forget I said that. Well, okay. <laughs> Anyway, all that aggravating bullshit aside, what were you gonna say? <laughs> Please, bitch, I'm the mailman. <laughs> God. John is so goddamn stupid. John. All right, I made a new friend. What? A friend. Oh, wait, a friend. Bullshit. No, it's true. John, this is so unlike you. You don't have fucking friends. None of us do. We're a bunch of total losers. I know that, but today is a different story. I think I might be branching out a little, socially, like turning a corner and becoming a valid and legitimate person while on his way to adulthood. Ugh. Come on, Dave. Why can't you just be happy for me? Please say that your friend is the mailman. Please. Please say that. I can't actually think about the situation because every time I do. <laughs> Fine. So you're hanging out with this person right now? Yes, he's in my room. Um, rummaging through my stuff. I'm doing what? <laughs> he's quite the character. <laughs> Who is this guy? Please say I'm the mailman. <laughs> I just really want him to say that so bad. <laughs> Please tell me he's not cooler than me. I couldn't handle that. He's not cooler than you. Nobody is, Dave. Oh, thank God. So tell me about him. Um, well... You know the mailman I was talking about earlier? Yeah. <laughs> well, you see. <laughs> John Eckford. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> It's the mailman. Jesus fucking Christ. What? John. No. <laughs> What's the big deal? Do I even need to explain why a 13... <laughs> Oh 
I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I need to... Do I even need to explain why a 13 year old kid shouldn't become buddies with the fucking mailman and hang out with him in his room? Does your dad know about this? Well, no, but I'm trying to avoid him. He's in one of his baking frenzies. You do realize this is the same guy who likely stole your game and my beautiful present, right? He probably sold them in the black market or worse. He did something fucked up like flushed them down the toilet. He didn't do that. Dave, that would make no sense to do that. You're being crazy. <laughs> K dude, but you're the one chilling with the random postal worker in your bedroom on your B-Day. I'm just looking out for you. <laughs> what sort of sick fuck would even want to come in your house? How old is the fucking guy anyway? <laughs> I'm Dave. <laughs> I don't know. He seems to be sort of ageless. What? Dave, that's the thing. He's barely even a person. What does that mean, John? God, God, I cannot wait to meet Dave after this conversation. <laughs> He's just a friend. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Moved. Listen, I don't expect you to understand. He's just a fun, harmless person who appears to have no particular defining qualities whatsoever. What is so crazy about that? Nothing, I guess. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Mood. <laughs> Fine. Enjoy your new buddy. It's your B-Day after all, so who you get to call the shots. So what's next on the agenda? What's he even doing now? Well, it seems like he got a little bored while I've been talking to you, and he spread most of my belongings across my bedroom floor to examine everything. And now he's just messing with stuff? Like my magic stuff, <laughs> it's pretty cute. I like this guy. John, I'm gonna run something by you. I hope I don't blow your mind or anything, but what if this guy isn't even a mailman? What? <laughs> Dave, no, I refuse to accept that. Okay then, genius, tell me this. <laughs> John Egbert is so fucking smart. He's the smartest character in Homestuck. Oh my god. <sighs> what is he wearing? Um, he said he has no defining qualities. Well, his clothes are defining qualities. So what are they? Okay, he isn't wearing anything but a sweatshirt. <laughs> Wait, I don't got pants. <laughs> oh, whoa. But I didn't want to mention that because I knew how it would sound. <laughs> to be fair, I feel like if anybody pestered him right now, they'd put it together too. Because none of them are John. <laughs> I feel like he, if he got trolled right now, the troll would put two and two together. And they don't even know anything. No, actually, if they got trolled right now, the troll would see. Okay, I love Jade too. But the thing is, she's not oblivious when she's awake. The problem was, she was asleep, like, for the whole first four acts a lot. Thanks, Vriska. And when she's asleep, she gets really, really ditzy. Which, honestly, I identify with that, because Dream Me is really stupid. Really, really stupid. Like, I was trying to lucid dream more, and there's a thing you can do. If you count your fingers in a dream, and obviously with tips like this, it might not be true for you. For instance, like, I can read just fine in dreams, but I know some people can't. But if you count your fingers in a dream, the number will come up wrong. So what you do is get into the habit of just counting your fingers at random, and then eventually you'll do it in a dream. And I did. 
and the number came up wrong and I was like oh no I just miscounted and I did it again and the number came up wrong again a different way and I was like oh no 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 I just miscounted again and I did that like five times and it came up a different wrong number every time and I just went Dah! and continued on so like it'd be like that sometimes <laughs> But I feel like she would be very, like, she wouldn't be all, oh, no, he's trying to, like, steal your stuff. But she would be suspicious, I think. Oh, God. So, no male uniform, no male bag, no, like, fucking mailman hat, just nothing. Yes. But that's not weird or anything. I told you, he's, like, a pet? Oh, John... Shit, that's probably condescending. You know what I mean. Part generic personality type guy and part like just a fun, friendly sort of humanoid creature? I'm not really explaining this well. The point is, he said he's a mailman and I believe him because he's my new friend. End of story. Okay, okay, he's the fucking mailman. <laughs> I don't even care if you think he's fine, then okay, whatever. So, like, cool? Guess we have a new friend. Do I get to meet the mailman sometime or what? I mean, just based on the name of the game? Uh-huh. <laughs> just, mm, I know how this goes. I'm gonna meet a lot of people. Hmm, that's a good question. I'm, I just got really overcome with the urge to put these Vriska glasses on my face and I don't know why and it's not gonna work well because like one they're Vriska glasses so they're sunglasses with a lens popped out and two I'm wearing normal glasses and I can't take them off because like I'm nearsighted and I can't read the chat like that where I have the chat I can read the game fine but nah but also my brain is telling me to do it so this sucks. This sucks. This sucks. I hate it. Anyway. <clears throat> hmm, that's a good question. I hope so. I wouldn't be surprised if he found his way over to you. I can't put my finger on it, but something tells me he's a well-traveled fellow. That was the wrong can of Pepsi. And <laughs> for some reason it took me that whole time to, <laughs> to realize that. This really sucks, but I don't want to take them off. <clears throat> you really think he's going to well travel his ass 2,000 miles over here to come visit me? I think that. You never know. Mailmen do get around after all. Shit, that checks out actually. Okay, I'm getting kind of excited now. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. I should probably get going. He's really going at it over there with all my bedroom crap. I don't want to be a rude host. Alright, I'm going to leave you boys to it. Happy birthday, dude. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I then. I a shorter day. So, when I first started... When I tested this out earlier to make sure, you know, it was set up the same way so I didn't have to change anything about my stream setup, um, I did look at these two and I read that this one was called A Shorter Day and I, I knew, I was like, oh, okay, let me guess, it's the, this is 13th birthday and we gonna fuck it up and you know what? I was right. <laughs> You ever think about how everything up until Cascade is literally all one day? <laughs> That's all one day? <laughs> I 
All right, Rose. Volume two, something beyond the sky. On the advice of your new friend John, you go to visit one of his close comrades, close only figuratively speaking, since it seems she lives all the way out on the other side of the country. That's no problem for you, though, since your new powers let you hop anywhere, anytime, even to places that don't exist. <coughs> well, you think your powers let you do that. You just have this distinct metatextual feeling that if you could pretty much go anywhere at this, that you could pretty much go anywhere at this point. You know that doesn't make any sense. There's nothing that doesn't make sense about friendship, though, and that's exactly what you're going about to do. Friendship, that is. You're about to do some friendship by making a new friend. Her name is, you check your notes, Rose. This is her house, apparently. Looks kind of weird and modern and is situated in the middle of the woods for no good reason you can think of. Thinking about where her house is and also how dangerous that is if there's a for forest fire. <coughs> um, remember when Dave threw her fucking bed into the fire for no goddamn reason? He could have put it literally every anywhere, but he threw her bed directly, directly into the fire. <laughs> because that still makes me angry to this day. Why? Why? Also, it's pouring rain, which is not what you would describe as ideal friend-making conditions. Still, nothing stops a mailman, not from delivering mail nor making friends. Rather famously, rain and other similar weather patterns provide no deterrent to the performance of his duty. God, I hope, I don't, I doubt it'll happen, but I really want to meet PM so she can be very, very mad about me, um, am I a Prospitten? I just thought about this. Is MSPA reader a prospitten? Because clearly you're not human and John described you as almost alien. I mean, you're supposed to be human, but like, what if you're not? And there's no duty more important than friendship. I don't even remember what I was saying something before I thought of that, but I don't even remember what it was, so. <clears throat> Rose! Suddenly a woodland girl approaches. Who goes there? Oh, it's your new friend Rose, obviously. There is literally no one else this could be. You introduce yourself. You're the cool mailman who John told her to expect a visit from soon. You would doff your mail hat to signal a friendly greeting, except recently you accidentally dropped it into a sewer, along with all your other mail-specific clothes, as well as well as all the mail you were supposed to deliver, and you explained to her graciously in an un you explained to her gratuitously in an unconvincing manner. It's not a great start, you admit, but you've done much worse. You are not a mailman. <laughs> no fucking shit. <laughs> Yikes! You are busted almost. They have to go. I'm sorry. This is bad. <laughs> You briefly consider whether you should double down on the lie and try to say something mailman-like, or whether the right call is to come clean. Oh, they did it to me with the music again. I hate how Homestuck has like five motifs and it's in, they're in every song, but still every time I hear any one of them. since she's clearly too smart for this amateur bullshit. But it's taking a few seconds too long for you to decide, which looks guilty as hell. That's it, the jig is up. You slouch in defeat. You ask her if she would please consider not telling John. Your heart couldn't take it if he found out your entire friendship was based on a lie. You want me to keep a secret from one of my best friends to protect the feelings of a random buffoon who I've never met and arbitrarily showed up to my house in the remote wilderness like a creep? Yes? <laughs> yes? Um, 
Yes, that's what you want. <laughs> it's an interesting proposition, if for no other reason than, than its audacity. I admire your resolve in the face of humiliation. This doesn't mean we're friends, though. Oh, oof, rough. Well, that's fine. You're hopeful. Your mind is fuzzy, but you think you remember this. You're good at this. You are excellent at making people like you through underhanded means. You can't wait to take advantage of this 13-year-old girl's goodwill. Okay, wow, not like that. Let's not be fucking weird. In fact, let, let that be the last creepy thought you have for comical purposes. S grade jokes only. Let's all get our brains out of the gutter. Rose raises a thin eye, a thin brow. There's something unsettling about her deep violet eyes. You're pretty sure most humans don't have eyes like that. Yay, yeah, what is up with the Strylons? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna call the other ones the Prospect Gang. <laughs> Not like the uh, Harling Crocker Birds or whatever, but like they have like the blue and green eyes. Like that's humans are, are like that. That's normal. What? Strylons? <laughs> I got a question. <laughs> well, what the fuck do you know? You're a stranger around these parts. Wait, aren't you a human too? Am I a... Am I a Carapician? Like, I'm from Frostbit. I, I, I'm, like, is that it? Is that what MSP8 or... M Eh, MSPA reader has been this whole time. Whatever, it's not a big deal. Not when there are friends to be made or something. Do you want to come inside? Unless I'm interrupting your internal monologue, of course. Far be it from me to ever cut short any sort of <laughs> navel gazing sidebar. It's just so ever so slightly wet out here. You would absolutely love that, if it's not too much trouble, of course. You wouldn't want to put Rose out. You're lying, though. You are 100% fine with being absolutely infuriatingly obnoxious if it means making a friend. Rose purses her lips, considering. Your predilections towards mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had certain powers? Powers of teleportation and time travel. I told him that he must be mistaking, mistaken, mistaken, yeah since it's a well-known and accepted fact that magic, although popular and highly engaging, although a popular and highly engaging subject of fiction, is fake as hell. Oh, your zappy powers? No, those are totally real and not fake. Real in a different way than, you're being, than you being a mailman is real, since that is actually made up. Is that so? Prove it. You shrug, easy enough. You hold out a hand and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers in yours. Her nails are long and sharp and painted a glossy black. She closes her eyes and her umbrella droops. Should I picture my room or something similar? I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work. She still thinks you're fucking with her. You tell her that you guess she can do that if she wants. You zap the two of you inside a big, the big modern house and when you open your eyes, you find yourself in a large messy bedroom. Oh, she drops her umbrella. You, Really? You really did that? Rose stands in the center of her, in the bit of her room in full rain gear. Her boots track muddy prints into the thick white carpet. Surprise! You really are magic. Rose puts a small hand against her perfectly painted black lips. She seems momentarily lost for words, and you get the feeling that it's not a thing that happens very often. Her eyes are wide and deeply purple. They're sparkling, you might even say. Oh, hold on, I'll be right back. Stay here. Don't go out into the hall. It's not... It's not safe. You tell Rose to take her time. You're happy to just stand here dripping on her nice clean floor. She leaves the room and you take the opportunity to examine your surroundings a little more closely. The bed is unmade. The books are strewn all over the floor, carelessly. And a collection of half-drunk cups of coffee crowd the desk. Half-finished knitting projects line, a so line in... Bleh, lie? in soft piles all over the room. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that this room is often occupied by someone with a lot of interest who has trouble settling down and putting her attention into one thing at a time. Man, you relate. Not with interest, but with friends. You can't imagine settling for just one. 
Rose has a number of posters on her wall, although nowhere near as many as your friend John. A calendar hangs beside the window, days ticked off with little X's, all the way up to 413, which is circled. You step closer to read the year day up in the corner. 2009, what the hell do you care about the date? You can make friends all day, you can make friends any day of the damn week, rain or shine, night or day. Rose sure is taking a while out there. She told you that it wasn't safe out in the hall. Maybe she hadn't been just, just been quipping. Maybe she's actually in trouble. What should you do? Let's go look for her. You are too anxious to sit still, and you aren't the sort of person who just sits there and waits for friend opportunities to fall in their lap. Better to run headlong into danger, or as much danger as a minimalist upper middle class house in the middle of the woods can offer. Rose had told you that it isn't safe. You creep out into the hallway where a bunch of things happen more or less simultane simultaneously. A deluge of quick time events that you had no idea were coming. <clears throat> Lightning flashes at a perfect jagged line across the tall window at the end of the hall, followed immediately by a crash of thunder so loud you think the house might be falling down. Abruptly, all the lights go out. Oh yeah, that is literally like, yeah, that, yeah, that happens. I, for I don't know why, but I always forget about her power going out. <laughs> like the whole whole first act is just her trying to get power so she can actually play the goddamn game. Another flash of lightning and for um vertiginous moment you see a long thin figure superimposed against the window. You freak the fuck out, jumping about a foot in the air and yowling like a cat. A small hand lands on your shoulder and you jump again. Calm down, it's just me. Rose speaks in a normal tone of voice and it's jarring. The house is echoey and cavernous, and there's just something about a dark house on a stormy evening that makes you want to whimper, whisper. I told you to stay put for a reason. It's too early for my mother to be sauced enough not to notice random strangers in her house, and I don't want to go through the tedious process of explaining who you are. You have a perfectly understandable reason for why you left, and that reason is you were lonely. Rose snorts. Cold. You mean you were cold? Well, you are soaking wet. Follow me. She grabs you by the wrist and tows you down the hall. You wonder if you should warn her about the strange wrath-like wraith-like creature you saw by the window. <laughs> Damn, Ro <laughs> why are we dragging Roxy like this? <laughs> but you don't want to freak her out. Although her mom might be at risk too. Whatever, moms are tough. She'll be fine. This probably isn't the first time she's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a, a weird Slenderman! Damn, MSPA reader! This house looks haunted as shit. Rose brings you to a dark laundry room that motions you to take off your hoodie, which you do, gladly because it's soaking wet. That's interesting. Hmm? The design on the front, does it mean anything? Oh yeah, it's kind of cool. A blue line that zigzags on one end like lightning. Looking at it makes you feel unsettled. You realize Rose is still waiting for a response, so you just hand her the hoodie and tell her no, you're pretty sure it's an abstract sign. Then you stand there while she tosses the sweatshirt in the dryer. Feeling the alarming currents of memory in your bloodstream, you're sure there must be something you forgot to do. You continue to feel weird as Rose hits the dryer button and nothing happens. Fuck. She hits the button a few more times, as if that will make a bit of difference when, her, when the power is out. She presses her thumb and forefinger to the bridge of her nose. Well, you aren't going to fit into anything of mine. She leads you down more long, long dark hallways. Man, this house is unreasonably huge. You ask Rose if a lot of people live here. No, it's just me, my mother, and a horde of liquids not soluble in water. Here, try not to drip on the carpet. You aren't sure how you're supposed to manage that, but okay. The room is large and dark, and when Rose parts the curtains, a flash of lightning illuminates a four-poster bed, a floor, a four-poster bed, a long counter, and a shelf covered head to foot in bottles. Rose vanishes through another door, leaving you to peruse. Peru, peruse. Woo.
this is yep this is all liquor shit this is a lot of booze here i'm not sure what you want would want to wear but we should work until the power comes back on and we can dry your clothes rose hands you a long silk robe she won't miss this i don't think she's ever even worn it she has this whole closet full of fantastic clothes that she never puts on you take the robe and go into the large master bedroom. It's kind of a mess. The tub looks like it hasn't been cleaned. No, bathroom. It. It's kind of a mess. The tub looks like it hasn't been cleaned in a long time. The robe gives you the same knotted feeling of familiarity that looking at your hoodie did, but you put it on anyway. It's a relief to get out of your wet clothes. You hang them carefully on the shower rod. When you head back into the bedroom, you find Rose standing in front of the wall of liquor. She's holding a bottle of Grey Goose and squinting at the label, like she's trying to read the nutrition facts. I've often wondered what, exactly, the merits of consuming this are. It tastes, quite literally, like burning. <sighs> she opens the bottle, and before you can protest that- <laughs> Oh! Yeah, this does, in fact, happen in the comic, doesn't it? That she is in by no means the legal a drinking age in wherever the fuck you are. She puts the bottle to her mouth and takes a sip. A sip. She splutters. Ugh! That's terrible. You could have told her that. Straight vodka isn't for the uninitiated, even fancy vodka. You take the bottle from her. She hesitates for a moment, then lets it go. You set it back on the shelf. This really is a... Quite an impressive liquor cabinet, liquor wall, liquor room. Her mom must have a really refined palate. Don't strain yourself. You can say it. What's the point of mincing words? She's a fucking alcoholic. Wow, this is intense. You're not sure if you're prepared for something this heavy. You were kind of counting on some silly shenanigans. Maybe a couple of funny jokes. You aren't cut out for this. You get the feeling that at some point you might have been cut out for this. You might have even been the sort of person your friends, or potential friends, could count on. In fact, you know on some level that this is true, but whenever you try to nail down any sort of specifics, you're, you're, yeah, you find a gaping lacuna in, the, your, in your experiences. It's all just white noise. Rose's shoulders slump as she stands surveying her mother's bottles. She doesn't even have the decency to hide her distasteful habits. Who needs an entire wall of liquor bottles? She doesn't have people over. She doesn't have any friends. This is all just for me. Just more of her passive aggressive act as a femme fatale 1950s housewife with a death with a death wish. Words. It's just like the wizards. Wizards? Don't worry about it. You know how long it's been since I've had a home cooked meal? And I'm not saying that I require, or even desire, a lovingly crafted culinary masterpiece every time I sit down to eat. That's going a bit far. I know John complains about being plagued by fatherly concern every chance he gets. He is overwhelmed by pastries whenever he ventures from his room. I'm glad my mother doesn't poke her considerable no nose into my private affairs, but I'm sick of eating oatmeal. Rose, I told you, don't worry about it. But you will worry about it. You worry about all your friends, all two of them. Rose smiles with half her mouth. It seems to be all she can, about all she can manage. Lightning crashes. She looks so small and sad against the, this wall of bottles. You know how to fix this. Thunder rolls and you clench your fist. A friendship clinch. You don't know who you are. You don't know why you're here, but you do know that surely you have these powers for a reason. And what better reason than helping a poor young girl with her troubled home life? <laughs> Shut up. I hate you, Sharice. If you want to see what I'm laughing at, you should join my Discord. Because <laughs> Sharice just made a dumb meme. <laughs> Rose. 
Rolling up your floppy sleeves, you get to work. What are you doing? I did, didn't I? <laughs> well, <laughs> you start with the dark liquors first. In your experiences, those cause worse, hang cause worse hangovers and are more likely to contribute to the absence of hot motherly meals and over the overconsumption of oatmeal. You grab two bottles of rum and, and one of bourbon, which you tuck in one armpit. Then you step out of the house and into a clearing in the nearby woods a couple hours ago before it started raining. You drop the bottles and go back for more. What if actually? <laughs> MSPA reader is just like, <laughs> fuck Homestuck. You guys get to live actually happy lives on Earth like normal people. Are you just stealing all of my mother's liquor? Is this your solution to her alcoholism? Don't worry, Rose can thank you later. And you go for the tequila next, then the vodka. Then you get sick of this organized approach and just start grabbing whatever the fuck and dumping it in the past. <laughs> Rose watches you do this for a while, then she hops up on the counter, crosses her legs, and starts texting. Wow, she's really so intent on our conversation that she isn't even noticing you fixing her domestic situation. She keeps giving you fleeting looks, and you're pretty sure she must be talking about you. You should just let her talk. It isn't right to try and invade your friend's privacy. You attempt to resist the temptation, which you fail at immediately. Not even o an overused meme can save you. You zap behind her onto the counter where you can spy on her private correspondence. As you do. I don't know anything about them, I'm sorry. Sigh. And here was me trying to take advantage of your uncanny ability to make guesses verging on prog prognostic prognostication. I'm recently considering a reevaluation on magic. Hmm. You don't know who this person is. Maybe you should just. You go back in time a couple minutes to when Rose started her conversation. Your past self is busily zapping back and forth carrying liquor bottles. You hunker down so you don't see yourself and cause a paradox or whatever the fuck. Out of morbid curiosity to shine a light on, it, on my future, I come... I come with a metaphorical hat in hand to ask you to, cons to, ask you to consult your dream clouds. Do you happen to know anything about a strange cardboard cutout creature masquerading as a mailman? Are you sleeping? Sorry, I had just sold Beck. I just, ugh, I had to scold Beck. He's been acting really weird all of a sudden. <laughs> Beck's like, the timeline done got fucked. I don't know what's going on, Jade. Anyway, is this the same mailman that John was talking about? The fake one who hung out with him? I, literally everyone is like, this is not a mailman. <laughs> That's the one. They are currently emptying my mother's liquor cabinet in an attempt to prevent her from overindulging herself. Oh, are they drinking it? No, I think they're just dropping it in the woods with their magic powers. Oh, hmm. Do they know that she could just go out and buy more liquor? That's something you can do where you live, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm playing <laughs> yet another Homestuck game, and this time, the Homestuck characters are here. Yes, well, not exactly where I live. I think the nearest boozery is a good 20 minute drive. I'm not actually entirely sure where my mother got it all. We don't own a car as far as I know. Sometimes it just seems like she has the ability to just make things appear. I don't know anything about them, I'm sorry. And here was me trying to take advantage of your uncanny ability to make guesses verging on prognostication, as I'm recently considering a reevaluation on magic. I'm still pretty sure magic is fake, at least the kinds of magic you're talking about. There's probably some real magic out there somewhere. Yes, for instance, the sort that lets you spy on your hostess's private correspondence while you are stealing her mother's libations. 
you freeze. With a contrite zap, you reappear in front of Rose. She sets her phone down and props her chin up on a delicate fist. Sorry, you honestly don't know what got into you. You couldn't just resist using your powerful power for evil. Have you heard that with great power comes great responsibility? Rose is right. She's totally right. You've only had this power for like a day, so you still aren't used to the idea of being able to just zap all over the narrative. Clearly, you did not appreciate the implications. Zapping all over the narrative sounds potentially stressful. Oh, you bet. You are incredibly stressed out, stressed right now. Rose laughs. You apologize to her for stealing all her mom's drinks. That was kind of overzealous of you. No, actually, I thought it was hilarious. I've never seen, I've never really been one for pranks. That's always fallen more in John's wheelhouse, but there's nothing wrong with occasionally stepping outside of one's comfort zone. Let's do the vodka next. The two of you work working together gets the place cleared out pretty quick. You zap Rose along with you to the bright clearing in the field, and for a moment she just stands in a sunbeam, blinking up at the cloudless sky. Her expression says she still might not be totally convinced any of this is happening. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! How, how- wait, is she picking up the bottles? With her hands? <laughs> When all the liquor has been transferred from the bedroom to the uh, bedroom to the woods in a big glittering dragon's hoard of booze, you and Rose fall down next to it in a messy heap. Well, you fall into a messy heap. Rose lowers herself daintily, sitting more on her knees than her butt, probably keeping her skirt from getting dirty. <laughs> They're invalid. You get the idea that even though she lives in the middle of nowhere, she doesn't spend a lot of time outside. You tell her again that you're sorry you spied on her co correspondence with her green friend Gigi. Also, you hope she isn't going to get in trouble with her mom. I'm not unduly concerned. I'll tell her where it all is in a couple days, although by the time, by that time I'm sure at least a good third of it will be water damaged. I'm sure this will have a fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure this will have fantastic implications for our relationship, and not at all exacerbate the emotional problems underlying her addiction. You laugh awkwardly. Well, now you kind of just feel like an asshole. Rose lies back in the grass and raises a hand to trace the curves of a fluffy white cloud. She closes her eyes. Perhaps it's just projection on my part or wishful thinking, but ever since I met you, I feel like something has changed. I'd say something has changed. Or rather, something has failed to change, if that makes any sense. By the way, to anyone watching who doesn't know, um, what's happened here is we have teleported magically to the day the story was supposed to start the story from Homestuck. We teleported to the beginning and we immediately fucked everything up. So I'm <laughs> eager to see how this goes. It's probably nothing. Her eyes flicker back open, endlessly purple, fixated on the sky like she can't, can see something beyond it. And once again, you feel like there's something really crucial that you forgot. But at least you've made a new friend, and even if you don't think Rose's brand would ever allow her to call you as such, you're lying in a sunny clearing next to a pile of alcohol, and honestly, it doesn't get much friendlier than that. Success. All right, let's see what the other route was. But like, have like, what is making this happen? Oh, I can't. I'm really excited to see how this goes. All right, I'm gonna go back here first. All right, let's stay put. Your patience pays off almost all, almost at once. Rose is back and looking significantly more put together. Also, she's brought you a towel. Here. 
I'm not overly attached to anything in here. It's mostly just childish nonsense I haven't yet bothered to rid myself of, but I'd appreciate it if you tried not to drip on any of the notebooks. Mm-hmm. Yes. She has changed. That's my emote that finally got accepted. You right. Oh, okay. What was I gonna say? And this, wink, wink, anybody else watching. <laughs> but once I get enough subs, this thing under on my sub points bar. That's gonna be the next emote once I get enough subs for it. <laughs> she's changed out of her raincoat and boots and she's dressed in a neat black skirt and white shirt with a purple <laughs> oh, ink. blob thing with tentacles. What is it with these kids in their blob shirts? Now that's dealt with. Now that's dealt with. Please sit down. She crosses her legs. You suddenly feel like you're at a job interview. Friend interview? You wish you were a little less damp. Actually, let's switch places. Uh, you're still pretty wet. You don't want to get her bedspread messed up. Don't worry about it. That's what washing machines are for. Now, let's talk about magic. Which up until now, I have always taken for granted as being something con confined to storybooks. Rose takes a wistful look towards her bedroom window, grayed over by and blurry with raindrops. You get the feeling that she's doing it for effect. Maybe that's why she wanted you to switch places with her. And then it comes to you, the not a mailman with a penchant for showing up and attempting to make friends with unwitting children. Well, fair. She's got you there, but honestly, she might be a child, but she really doesn't seem to be unwitting. On the contrary, she's really quite witting. Witty. You are right about that. <laughs> Doc Scratch, I look away from the narrative for five minutes. <laughs> Gotta hope MSPA reader remembers reading all this. At some point. <laughs> you need to read the epilogue because I just got a theory and I can't say it because you don't know about that yet. Because you're in candy, right? And you haven't read any meat, Charisse. I'm just, while you're, I'm going to type this theory. <laughs> you, I mean, I'm going to type this theory out so that I don't bring it in. I'm glad you noticed. She folds her hands and clears her throat. You think that if she had any notes, she would be shuffling them. And so, the question remains, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Or are you a wizard? We've already established that you are not a public servant. Is there a difference between a witch and a wizard? Of course there is, but exactly how specific of a difference can vary. According to some works of fiction, a wizard is just a witch's male counterpart. But in certain mythologies, for instance, Arthurian legend, the difference appears to be class-based. Wizards reside at court and are classically trained while witches are self-taught and run wild through the forest. I won't deny that those differences tend to often be gendered as well. You ask her which one she is, a witch or a wizard. Me? Rose shifts, uncrossing and recrossing her legs. You shrug and say that she just seems to know a lot about them. I know a thing or two. But can I tell you a secret? Oh my god, Rose. She has no idea how much you would love to hear her secret. I find them, wizards, I mean, utterly reprehensible. They disgust me, 
Everything from their foppish robes to their grizzled beards is my mother who's the wizard enthusiast in this house. Although, she glances from side to side theatrically. Most of the things Rose seems does seems to be a little, at least a little bit theatrical. She kneels on the carpet besides the cluster of books. I don't show these to many people, actually. I haven't shown them to anyone. Not even John? John seems like a pretty cool guy. Definitely a guy worth sharing a few secret notebooks with. Rose laughs. No, I haven't shown them to John. And I've only shown Sh Sh Strider to punish him. <laughs> You're not, pretending that you know who the Strider person is. You are a totally normal dude with an absolutely ungodly number of friends. A shadow moves through the center of you, a trembling moment of deja vu. You, you do have a lot of friends, don't you? That feels true. But the only people you know here are John and now Rose. Weird. You try to put it from your mind and listen to Rose again. She's still talking about this mysterious Strider, flipping through one of the journals, too quickly for you to see anything specific, only that it's full from cover to cover. As if my modest writings are <laughs> the sole source of Homer erotic tension in his life, when his brother is the one who insists on filling their home with assorted dick butt for ironic purposes. Rolls, rolls her eyes. Oh boy, you missed the beginning of that. It probably made way more sense than it seemed like. Not really, not really. Rose is searching through her notebooks, checking markings on the spine that seem to be some sort of cataloging system of arcane symbols. Where is- oh, right. She does something quick and complex with her fingers, and another notebook pops into existence and falls- Oh, so no- we definitely are capsulizing. <laughs> we definitely still have our Silodex, huh? <laughs> she really is a wizard. What? It's just a Silodex. A child could use one. Here. The notebook has a couple drawings in it, but most of it is filled with, a, with small, neat handwriting and lavender ink. Is Rose writing a book? No, don't be silly. I'm writing four books at least. <laughs> Five, depending on whether I decide to flesh out um, Kalmas' backstory. It isn't strictly necessary, but it does add a certain amount of valuable character insight which renders their actions in later volumes more sympathetic. Not that I need any of my anti-heroes to be sympathetic, I'm just saying of what the literacy reviewers would say. I'm just thinking of what the literacy reviewers will say. You nod. Smart. You would never have thought of the literacy <laughs> literary reviewers you, ne bleh. you would never have thought of what the literary reviewers would say. She is honestly pretty impressive for someone of her age. Age has nothing to do with it, but don't get carried away. It's only a rough draft. You ask her if you can take a look. She hesitates, but you doubt she would have shown you if she didn't want you to look. What the hell? If you can't trust the strange spherical imprint you met outside of the in the rain, who can you trust? Right? Your thoughts exactly. Rose hands you the notebook and you open it at random, letting fate guide your hands. You're really gonna make me read the wizard? Okay. Priglish bothered, bothered his beard as if, uh, as if unkinking a hitch in the long silk windsock. More pedestrian audience, a more pedestrian audience would parse the exhibit as a nervous compulsion, behavior to petition contempt among, among the reasonable. He was, however, not surrounded by the reasonable, but the wise, the distinction in men that would forever be the difference in history's garland of treasured follies. As a matter of fact, his um, charade of fellow wizards are all putting similar moves on their beards as well. This is no, this is the passage. I have not played Doki Doki Literature Club. I know, I know there's a twist. I don't know what the twist actually is, but I know there is one. <laughs> But no, this is the passage. This is the passage from the story. I just reread it mm, a few months ago now, but I definitely remember this part where they're all stroking their beards at once. I remember this. To practice with events thoughtfulness, sagacity even, if they didn't think to do it all the time, if they didn't do it all the time, standing in line at the bank, shooting squirrels from bird feeders, few occasions were safe. 
Zazerpan, I don't want to read, I don't want to read the wizard, the same, ex I don't want to read the wizard fiction. Zazerpan inspected the clue, a single piece of evidence cradled in his, um, Kurikesha's old man's palms. It was a human bone, not striking in the tale it told alone so much as that it was, yeah, so much as told by the thousands like it festooning in the marshy soil of the mass grave. The grisly expanse bore the texture of a decadent dessert, like one of Smar Smarney's formidable custard trifles wobbled out on the wheels of for the holidays to the dismay of a small nation. You're certain of this? asked Friglish. Despite what he was doing with his beard, he was, in fact, immersed in meaningful contemplation. I'm afraid I'm becoming more so with each terrible tick groused by that gaudy timepiece slung around your neck. In case it wasn't clear, Friglish wore a clock Zazapan didn't care for. It was magic. The massacre of Sears Gnelp was not as written. Wow, this is pretty dense, but smart. You stroke your own imaginary beard and pretend to ponder the deeper meaning. Hmm, yes, intriguing. Zazapan and Friglish. Clearly there is some history here. Yes, clearly. But what the two of them shared went beyond simple romance. That's why it has gone so spectacularly sour. Rose become increasingly more animated as you she tells you about her gay wizard OCs, like she's far more interested in them than she is in herself. They share an intellectual bond, a mutual dedication to knowledge and the preservation of such. The goal of the learned is to amass their wisdom and keep it from general decima yeah, dissemination into the main populace of wizards. They feed it to their apprentices in drips and drabs. Of course, this will eventually lead to ruin. Of course. You flip further in the book, searching for the part where it leads to ruin. Ruin sounds interesting. Zazapan knew he would see his wayward apprentice again. Knew it, would be, it, knew it like he knew the tide would turn and the sun would blaze to a zenith as each inexorable, inexorable, inexorable bleh, day passed. Now they stood diametrically opposed across an overgrown chessboard. His apprentice's eyes were hidden behind dark glasses, but Zazapan knew if he could see him, they would be riddled with the madness of the void. This exact passage is also just in Homestuck. <laughs> Kalmasis wasn't here for justice or revenge. They were here exclusively because Zazapan had something they wanted, something they were owed. You flip through the notebook, checking out the drawings. There are lots of wizards, each more bearded and venerable than the last. One of the pictures, the most recent maybe, since it's on the very last page of the journal, is of two young wizards. Twins, maybe? They have gray hair and are wearing slick green suits, and are standing back to back with their arms entwined, staring into the middle distance. It's very anime. You compliment Rose on her artistic prowess. Yes, thank you. They're alright. It's a much better- I'm a much better writer than I am an artist. You tell her you think she's really good. Way better than you. You're absolutely positive she's going to be famous one day. I appreciate the encouragement, even though I know you're just trying to flatter me, due to your strange thirst for affirmative experiences. John told me all about that. Damn, busted. But you really do think she's talented. It's fine. It's not as if my social calendar is over full out here in the middle of the woods. Don't tell anyone I said that I don't have many friends. I don't, and don't tell them I've been drawing. <laughs> He'd be insufferable. He? Never mind. You assure Rose that her secrets are safe and hand her back her journal and are really excited about your new friend, if you might be so bold, and her wizard stories. Although, wait, hadn't she said that she hated wizards? What's your point? Well, you're no expert on wizards or on Rose, but it seems like she actually does seem to like them because she has several notebooks full of wizard fiction. You aren't trying to get like real here, but maybe it's possible her mom isn't the only one in the family who likes wizards? Rose pulls her book out of your hands. That, and the rest of the books vanish into thin air. Oh right, that must have been that, what has she called it? Silidex? She doesn't look angry exactly, but the lines around her mouth and eyes that soften as she talked about her book have hardened backed up. Her eyes glitter menacingly. Oh is that right, Freud? Well, why don't you diagnose me? Oh hey, wow, you weren't trying to be condescending or whatever. Clearly. Were you aware that it is a common psychological phenomenon for an individual to react to trauma by creating fictional representations of that which has caused them bodily harm or emotional dismay? 
To suggest that the portrayal of those fictional renderings somehow condones them or supports them is absolutely absurd. So what she's saying is she draws wizards to cope. Rose rises re re regally to her feet. The lightning turns her into an ethereal silhouette. What I'm saying is I don't need to justify my fictional predilections to you or anyone else. No, no, she's totally right. You're sorry that you suggested she might like wizards. It was horribly presumptuous and not at all a way a friend should act. You are again, you are so, so sorry. You promise it will never happen again. No, I don't suppose it will. It's probably just because Rose's hair is a pale blonde, but it almost looks like she's glowing in the dim bedroom. Like light behaves a little differently around her than it does on everything else. Would you look at that? It appears the rain has lightened up a bit. The rain is hitting the window so loudly you're actually having trouble hitting, hearing her. And your point is? You can zap yourself out to where the weather is drier. Fuck off. I didn't. And then, last but not least, let's see the insta, the insta get out of here. No. Man, you guess today is the day you get owned by, <laughs> you get owned by teens. She is totally right. What are you, what are you doing just wandering up to her house without even calling her first? It's just totally disrespectful of her time. No need to self flagellate. It was a simple suggestion to more critically examine your motivations and actions in the future. No, no, she's right. You're going. You zap away, aiming for a spot half a mile away in the woods where you can become properly soaked and miserable. But instead of trees, you find yourself standing in front of a bank of computers. Shit, you misfired. Wait, you remember seeing a big structure off in the distance where you were in front of Rose's house. You figured it was some sort of office building, but this looks more like a factory or a secret research lab. The computers show co um, coordinates on the screen that don't mean anything to you. A countdown clock is frozen on 413. All of this has the trappings of a tableau someone set up for you to see. Turning away from the screens, you wander down a line of gleaming science fiction, fiction equipment. It reminds you of pictures of old computers from the 1950s, the one that took up entire rooms. You bet you could go back to and visit some, some of those if you zapped hard enough. You wander through a whole you wander through a whole maze of halls and wide echoing rooms that aren't pictured because our art budget is only so big. But take it as a certainty that they are all very mysterious. <coughs> Eventually, you circle back to that strange bank of screens. Nervously, you hit a few keys, tap a few fingers against the readouts, nothing. It's all locked down. You think that if you could only get these screens to unlock, you can unravel the secrets to life, the universe, and everything. Or maybe your memories are trying to unlock, and maybe you'll understand seeing the seething water, waters yep, of this endless ocean of time and space entwining, intertwining in the meow, uh, meow, meow. Oh! You turn around expecting a cat, and you do get a cat, a very adorable black kitten, tiny and soft, with far more eyes than a cat should have. Aww. But the cat isn't the only thing here. A woman in sleek in a sleek white lab coat and sensible heels holds the cat, pinning you to the spot with her gaze, or at least you assume she is. Her hair is in her eyes and the light is behind her, so all you can see of her face are her painted lips. Uh, sorry ma'am. You absolutely didn't mean to trespass in her secret science lab, and you actually aren't even lying. You really did just fuck up this time. The lady puts the cat down slowly, where it rolls on his back and paws <laughs> and bats a paw playfully in the air. Aw, cats are great. Even mutant cats. Maybe especially mutant cats. This little guy should have a name. Hmm, you think you'll name them? Cryptic McWisters. Yeah. Cryptic McWisters is a great name. In fact, you can't imagine anyone naming this cat anything else. You hold out a hand to Cryptic McWisters and wriggle your fingers. It rolls back onto its feet and saunters over to you. It is, a soft and it is as soft and fluffy as it looks, and its four eyes blink up at you with utter trust. At least this kitty will be your friend. The ominous clack of heels on cement reminds you that you and Cry that Cryptic McWisters are not alone. 
while you are busy with the kitty cat, the very intimidating and well coffee lady has walked over to the bank of screens. She presses a button and it must be some sort of fingerprint recognition or retinal scanning or maybe she just be she's just better at things than you are because it works for her. On the floor a few feet from you is a round gray protrusion, a platform on the floor. You saw it earlier, but you had no idea what it was for, so you just ignored it. What you don't understand can't hurt you, right? You think that's probably right. The intimidating lady presses a button on the screen, mouth turning up at the corners. I <laughs> A flash and a pop, like the pressure in the room changes. You feel it in your eardrums. A pumpkin appears on the round gray platform. Fuck. Mm, you aren't really sure what she's trying to say here. Making a pumpkin appear out of thin air is impressive, but it probably would have been more so if you hadn't been popping in and out of existence all day. It's going to take more than a, than a pumpkin to impress you. Pumpkin? What pumpkin? <laughs> the lady shakes her head and hits another button. The pumpkin vanishes and in its place is a tiger. Yes, you heard that right! A whole ass tiger! Orange and black, big teeth and big paws. For the, a second, the two of you just look at each other. Honestly, the tiger might be more shocked than you are. Kinda sucks to think about. One second, you're just chilling in the savannah, mauling antelopes and drinking the water at the watering hole, and the next thing, you're in a secret lab in upstate New York, staring down a very unappetizing looking pro protagonist. <laughs> Apparently, you are appetizing enough for it to want to get a taste, though, because it looks from you to Cryptic McWhisters and back again, then it charges. You try and book it out of there. The lady in the lab coat looms up in front of you. She's saying something. You strain to hear her. The tiger is right behind you. The lady or the tiger. At least the last minute you remember you have magic powers and you choose the third option. Teleporting the fuck out of there. Oh, not again. You just zapped into yet another unknown building. Although from the view of the window, you think you might be in Rose's house. <laughs> Also, the fact that Rose turns to Kerner in her hallway and stops short, still in her rain gear. Her eyes are very wide. You wave awkwardly. She's, that snaps her out of it. She stands up straight, sliding easily from shock to of superiority. So you thought you'd just let yourself in? After wasting my time mumbling about the mail, a gaudy display of ma manipulative self-recrimination, and then popping out of existence to leave me asking myself if I'd finally lost my mind? You hadn't meant to do any of that, especially not the last part. She isn't losing her mind, unless both of you are losing your minds together. Rose looks you over finally. Wait, looks you over. Finally, she seems to decide that you are for, that, that you are for real. Your predilections towards mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had certain powers? Powers of teleportation and time travel. When I told him that he must be mistaken since it's a well-known and, <laughs> and accepted fact that magic, although popular and highly engaging, is subject to friction, is fake as hell. Your zappy powers, those are real. Um, she still got her umbrella open. Hey, doesn't she know that's bad luck? Bad luck? Bad luck? Luck is also fake as hell. You say you can do magic. Prove it. But she just saw you vanish out in front of her yard. Like I said, I could be losing my mind. She could be losing it now at this very minute, but you see no point in arguing. You hold out a hand, and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers to yours. Her nails are long and shout, yet this is closed. Same. Should I picture my room? Yeah, she can if she wants. Oh, and we're in a room. Alright, is this just... Oh, she drops her umbrella. You really did that. Yep. Oh. All right, well, that's that. Well. Oh, <laughs> Cryptomus Whiskers. Oh, yeah, I'll be right back. And then I guess it's time for an hour of an hour of um 
the other game that I said I'd play Snail Mail because we're done with all the Pester Quest that's out. BRB.